It's a cool, breezy day in the late 1980s at Patrick Henry Middle School in Northridge, California, in the San Fernando Valley. A young boy walks through the halls and does his best to be invisible. He's a math geek and looks the part. His dad is a simple engineer, his mom an advertising executive. They value education, so they've always made sure he has the latest and greatest in everything, including computers. The boy has a natural gift with numbers. He can solve complex equations in his head in the blink of an eye. It's made him a favorite of his math teacher and a target for ridicule from his peers. The boy hopes he can make it to his next class without anyone noticing him or picking on him. But as he reaches into his locker to grab a textbook, Hey, Rain Man! The boy looks up to find an older bully scowling at him. What do you think you're doing? I'm just grabbing my math book. Oh, math class. Here's a math problem for you. How many fingers am I holding up? The boy ignores the middle finger. He closes his locker and tries to escape, but the bully blocks his path as a crowd of students gathers. And now, where do you think you're going? Going to class, just leave me alone. As the boy tries to walk away, the bully knocks his textbooks out of his hands. The boy's eyes flash red. Ooh, looks like someone's upset. The bully gets right in his face with a devilish glint in his eye. What are you going to do about it? Huh? What are you going to do? The boy grits his teeth. He's naturally aggressive, but this kid is bigger, stronger, and he doesn't want to get hurt. So he lowers his head and takes a step back. Uh, That's what I thought. See you around, Rain Man. Travis Kalanick, Uber's first CEO, said he hated feeling like an outcast, that being bullied in middle school instilled in him a fighter spirit and a determination to never let anyone push him around again. In high school, Travis learned how to manipulate his image. He began to dress and act cool. He ran track, played football, got a girlfriend. But he was always whip smart. His natural talent for numbers helped him score a 1580 on his SATs, just 20 points shy of perfect. After high school, Travis studied computer engineering at UCLA before dropping out to become a tech entrepreneur. He founded one company that failed to launch, but then a second one that sold for nearly $19 million. Travis would go on to create the world's most popular ride-sharing app, Uber. In his quest for global ride-share domination, he would go to war with taxi operators and local politicians, journalists, and competitors. Travis saw himself as David taking on Goliath, But that's Travis Kalanick's story, as told by Travis Kalanick. Travis's story might be a tale of David turning into Goliath. Perhaps Travis's experience as an ostracized math geek drove him. Or perhaps it's a convenient story to justify his own behavior. But he did co-found one of the 21st century's most innovative and important companies, battling enemies he created along the way. In the end, Travis's foibles would cost Uber, and they would cost Travis control of the company he helped create. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is Business Movers. According to Travis Kalanick, Uber was created on a snowy Paris night in 2008 when two tech entrepreneurs, Travis and his friend Garrett Camp, couldn't get a cab and came up with a brilliant idea, an on-demand ride-sharing app that would allow a consumer to hail a car with a click of a button. But that's not exactly the truth. The two co-founders were in Paris for a tech conference in 2008, but Garrett had already come up with the idea months earlier. It wasn't called Uber, and it wasn't an app yet. It was a website, ubercab.com. To escape the bad weather, the two men took an elevator to the top of the Eiffel Tower, where they had a brainstorm, or jam session, as Travis called them. Garrett wanted Ubercab to own a fleet of limousines and to employ professional drivers. On that snowy night at the top of the Eiffel Tower, Travis made an inspired contribution. 
He told Garrett not to buy cars or hire drivers. He said that once the app was ready, he should give it to professional drivers and let them be free agents who would use the app to make extra money in between gigs. Garrett liked the idea, and soon Uber Cab was off to the races. Garrett would take a seat on the board. Travis would become CEO. Uber was a pioneer in the peer-to-peer sharing economy. It was one of the first companies, and Travis one of the first CEOs, to figure out how to massively scale using other people's property and time to provide a service and make money off of it. Uber did it first with limos and town cars, and then eventually with amateur drivers and personal vehicles. In just a few short years, Travis turned the small, scrappy startup into the most popular ride-sharing app in the world. But as it expanded across the globe, Uber faced tremendous backlash, especially from the taxi industry, which Uber was certainly disrupting. In the face of this resistance, Travis would not cower. The story of Travis's battle to the top begins in 2010, shortly after Uber's official launch in its first city, San Francisco. This is the first episode of our four-part series on Uber. Hashtag winning. It's October 2010 at a shared workspace in San Francisco, California. Travis Kalanick strolls through the front door, feeling invincible. Travis doesn't look like a typical Silicon Valley tech geek. With his square jaw and spiky hair, Travis is what many in the media call a tech bro, one of the bad boys of Silicon Valley. Travis is in his mid-30s, which makes him over the hill by Silicon Valley standards. But the scrappy entrepreneur just raised one and a quarter million dollars in seed funding for his new startup, UberCab, an app that offers on-demand black car service in San Francisco. But Travis's good mood is about to be spoiled by his vice president, Ryan Graves, who rounds the corner all business. Ryan is normally a chipper guy, but today his all-American smile is nowhere to be found. Travis, what's up, Graves? Can I grab you for a minute? Sure, everything all right? Ryan holds up a letter from the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, the SFMTA. At the top, written in bold, are the words, cease and desist. Travis's smile fades, replaced by a determined glare. All right, get the team together. Now. Inside a cramped room, Travis huddles with his small team of Uber cab employees, or as Travis calls them, Uberettos. They listen as Ryan reads the letter aloud. The name Uber Cab indicates that you are a taxi cab company or affiliated with a taxi cab company, and as such, you are under the jurisdiction of the SFMTA. This is bad news, Travis. Mm, relax. You've just been served. Don't tell me to relax. Well, what did he say to you, the man from the city? Well, he said we're breaking the law. He said that every day we stay open without a permit, they can fine us up to five thousand dollars. Five grand a day? Well, oh, fine. We can handle that. Five grand a day per ride. We're doing hundreds of rides a week. This would bankrupt us. Calm down, Ryan. These people at the MTA are in the pockets of the taxi industry. They're scared of us. That's why they're doing this. They know that when the people of San Francisco figure out how easy it is to use our service, they'll never call a cab again. And that's exactly the point. He also said I could face up to 90 days in jail. We all could. Look, I'm not going to jail for Uber cab. Nobody's going to jail. Nobody. He's just trying to scare you. Well, yeah, well, it's working. What are we supposed to do about this, Travis? Travis looks around the room and sees the terrified faces of his team. But Travis isn't afraid. He snatches the notice out of Ryan's hands. He quickly scans the document, and then a smile appears on his face. All right, here's what we do. Nothing. We ignore it. What do you mean we ignore it? They're saying we don't have the permits we need to operate as a cab company, right? I, that's, that's about it, yeah. So we drop cab from our name, and we're not a cab company. We're a transportation network company. Is, is that even a thing? It is now. This isn't going to stop them, Travis. They're going to keep coming after us with everything they got. Well, let them. In October of 2010, Travis officially dropped cab from the name and stuck with Uber to avoid local regulation. But he had national aspirations. To expand beyond San Francisco, Travis needed money, and a lot of it. He needed a venture capitalist, or VC, a private equity investor who funds companies with big growth potential in exchange for a stake in the business. 
Typically, a startup's first round of venture capital comes in the form of seed funding, usually tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uber had secured a large seed round of one and a quarter million in October. From there, startups can take on a series of additional funding rounds that usually grow in size, Series A, Series B, Series C, and so on. Travis needed an investor with deep pockets to put together his Series A funding round so he could launch Uber in cities all across the country. He would find what he was looking for in a lanky Texan named Bill Gurley. At six foot nine, Bill was easily the tallest VC in Silicon Valley. But in contrast to his height, Bill had a diminutive personality. He was a reserved, thoughtful man with a quiet intelligence and a reputation for picking winners. In Uber, Bill saw massive potential for growth, and he wanted his San Francisco venture capital firm Benchmark to be part of it. Travis wanted Benchmark, too. Bill was famous in Silicon Valley, and not just for his height. Travis subscribed to Bill's popular tech blog, Above the Crowd. The two had been playing cat and mouse for some time, until early in 2011, when Travis called Bill and invited him to the W Hotel to talk business. Their conversation stretched into the early hours, and at the end of it, the two men agreed that Uber was worth roughly $60 million. Bill wanted to invest $11 million in exchange for nearly 20% of the company and a seat on the board. Travis said yes and sealed the deal with a handshake. Bill's investment would pay off. In 2019, after Uber went public, Bill would receive one of the biggest payouts in the history of venture capital, over $600 million. Bill's sterling reputation in Silicon Valley enticed more investors into the fold. It was an impressive list. Hollywood actors Ashton Kutcher, Olivia Munn, and Edward Norton, talent agent Ari Emanuel, and Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. Soon, Uber closed a Series B investment round, bringing in another $37 million. Though at the time, Uber was still a small company, early investors saw potential. According to one of them, in February of 2011, Uber had 9,000 customers and net earnings of nearly $2 million. The investor believed that Uber would hit $100 million by the end of the same year. But that would only happen if Uber's nationwide rollout was a success. In May of 2011, with Uber firmly established in San Francisco, Travis set his sights on the Big Apple. If Uber could succeed in the massive, taste-making metropolis of New York, it could thrive anywhere. But the fight for New York was bound to be difficult because of the powerful and entrenched taxi operators who dominated New York's streets for decades. So Travis did in New York what he had done in San Francisco. He ignored local rules and regulations and charged ahead. Travis was always secretive with his numbers, so it's not clear how well Uber actually performed in New York in the early days. But if Travis is to be believed, Uber took off fast. As he told one reporter in 2011, the best metric I can give you is that Uber is killing it in San Francisco and we're crushing it in New York. If Uber was crushing it, Uber's head of global expansion, Austin Geit, deserved much of the credit. When Austin started working for Uber back in 2010 as an intern, she was Uber's fourth employee, but easily one of Travis's smartest hires. She embodied Travis's favorite motto, always be hustling. Austin did it all, market research, logistics, and most importantly, global expansion. As Austin launched Uber in New York, she took detailed notes of the process and developed what she called a scrappy version of the Uber playbook. The goal was to make Uber so popular with the locals that government officials couldn't shut it down without facing a severe backlash. Austin's playbook was efficient and effective. Determine local regulations and find creative workarounds. Recruit drivers from limo companies. Set the right price for each city. Create local buzz in the media. And most importantly, achieve viral growth through word of mouth marketing. Word of mouth was Uber's most effective weapon. But Travis wanted the right words coming out of the right mouths. So Travis focused on getting tastemakers, actors, musicians, tech entrepreneurs, and influencers to fall in love with the app and gush about it on social media. Austin planned swanky parties and lured local influencers who would become living advertisements for the company. Travis had the foresight to realize that a one-size-fits-all approach wouldn't work in every city. What was successful in San Francisco might not be in New York. Different cities had different cultures and different local regulations. 
So Travis would hire a local team to run operations in each new city. Travis and the corporate team would be there to give support and guidance, but Uber's local city teams had the latitude to make decisions about how to spend money and market the app. By the time Uber launched in its third city, Seattle, in August of 2011, Uber's expansion engine was a well-oiled machine. In the span of just a few weeks, Uber was the talk of the Emerald City. And by the time local officials and regulators knew what was happening, it was too late. Uber had reached critical mass. After Seattle, it was a matter of rinse and repeat. In 2011, Uber quickly expanded further to Chicago, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. Uber was in Paris by the end of the year and would soon be in London, Melbourne, Milan, and Sydney. In the span of three years, the once small startup would expand to 46 different countries. But Uber had plenty of competition at home, including one company that sprung up in its own backyard. In May of 2012, San Francisco locals started noticing bright pink mustaches on dashboards all over town. The mustache was the official symbol of Lyft, a new peer-to-peer -peer ride-sharing app in San Francisco. Uber used black town cars, limousines, and professional drivers. Lyft used amateurs. To drive for Lyft, all a person needed was a phone, a car, and a driver's license. It was cheap, easy, and accessible. Travis saw Lyft's potential, and he reacted quickly. He instructed his team to meet with local regulators in secret to convince them that Lyft was breaking the law and had to be stopped. But the local regulators didn't go after Lyft the way they had with UberCab. Perhaps because Lyft, like Uber, was a massive hit and politicians were afraid of blowback. So Travis pivoted. Travis had initially wanted Uber to be a high-end, exclusive service of black town cars, but Lyft's popularity and the massive potential of the peer-to-peer -peer market was hard to ignore. So Travis launched UberX, a low-cost peer-to-peer option. In the UberX announcement, Travis stated, We could have chosen to use regulation to thwart our competitors. Instead, we chose the path that reflects our company's core. We chose to compete. But Travis would not be sportsmanlike. He was the kind of man who needed to win and win big. In Travis's mind, if he didn't destroy the competition, it wasn't a victory at all. So Travis took the fight to Lyft, determined to win at all costs, and to make sure Uber was the last app standing. It's spring 2013 at Uber's San Francisco headquarters, and Travis Kalanick is fast walking. He always paces around the office when he has something big on his mind, or when he's trying to get business done. But today, Travis isn't trying to make a deal. He's trying to blow one up. Uber's biggest competitor, Lyft, is trying to put together a pool of investors for their latest round of funding. So Travis dials a potential Lyft investor. Well, Mr. Kalanick, to what do I owe this pleasure? Hey, a little bird told me you're thinking of taking Lyft to the dance. Uh, I guess word travels fast. You're making a big mistake. Mm, we don't see it that way. You really want to put your firm's capital behind a copycat? Because that's all they are. Uh, yeah, well, we like what we see with Lyft. Are you committed? I can't get into the details, but no, we haven't signed anything. Well, good, don't. Travis, there's a lot of potential with Lyft. They were the first ones in a peer-to-peer. Well, it doesn't matter who's first. It matters who's best. Travis ducks inside an empty conference room for some privacy. <sighs> Listen, we know they're going to raise a ton of money, but so are we. Before you invest in a copycat, just make sure you know that we are going to be fundraising immediately after. When? Our Series C is right around the corner. What's the valuation? Big. How big is big? 3.5 billion. Billion. And remember this. I won't let you invest in Lyft and Uber. You have to pick one. And once you do, there's no going back. Well, I'll take it under consideration. You do what you want, but if I were you, I'd bet on Uber. And why is that? Because I don't lose. We're about to blast off, my friend. Better hop on while you still can. Travis didn't just work behind the scenes to undermine Lyft. He waged a war of words on social media. Back in March, Travis tweeted directly at Lyft co-founder John Zimmer, trying to cast suspicion on the legality and safety of Lyft. We've talked to dozens of lifters, none of which have ever seen an insurance policy. 
Zimmer quickly replied, Travis, seems like you're fishing for info and might need some insurance. The lengthy back and forth came to an end when Zimmer tweeted, Travis, seems like you want the last word. I'll let you have it so I can get back to work. Smiley face emoji, hashtag respect. And of course, Travis did get the last word, tweeting, At John Zimmer, you've got a lot of catching up to do. Hashtag clone. John Zimmer's strategy for taking Lyft nationwide did resemble Travis's. Use influencers to build a local grassroots movement and make Lyft so popular that it would be impossible to shut down. And like Uber, Lyft was catching on fast. But where Travis was seen by many as the elitist bad boy of Silicon Valley, Zimmer and company tried to position Lyft as the good guys who wanted to help the environment by reducing the number of cars on the road. When Travis's network of Silicon Valley spies discovered that Lyft was getting ready to roll out a carpool feature, Travis decided to get in on the act. He ordered his chief product officer to develop one for Uber and have it ready before Lyft launched theirs. As a result, Uberpool beat Lyft to market, and Lyft again looked like a copycat. But Travis's tweeting and ruthless competitive tactics didn't help his reputation. He wasn't trying to win a popularity contest, though. He was trying to win a war for market share. And to achieve that victory, he needed a bigger war chest. So Travis hired a new senior vice president of business, an Egyptian-born powerhouse named Emil Michael. Travis and his deputy Emil were an unstoppable fundraising team. By the summer of 2014, Travis and Emil had raised over a billion dollars in venture capital. With such deep pockets, Travis was able to launch an expensive anti-lift marketing campaign in San Francisco, buying up ads and billboards with the slogan, Shave the Stash. He sent employees dressed in Uber Black to crash Lyft parties, hand out Uber swag, and try to recruit Lyft drivers. The new investment dollars also allowed Travis to accelerate Uber's growth by subsidizing it. He lowered prices and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in San Francisco alone on driver bonuses and free rides for new users. But Travis wasn't the only one who knew how to raise and spend money. Throughout 2014, Lyft's John Zimmer raised hundreds of millions of dollars of his own to take the pink mustache nationwide. And as Lyft expanded beyond San Francisco, so did Travis's efforts to block its path. Some of those efforts would place Uber at the center of a scandal. In August of 2014, a technology website called The Verge published a story revealing something called Operation Slog, a top-secret, highly-coordinated effort at Uber to sabotage Lyft in New York. As part of Slog, Uber deployed teams armed with credit cards and burner phones to request Lyft rides, recruit their drivers, and sometimes cancel rides to avoid detection. Reportedly, slog resulted in thousands of canceled rides, which cost Lyft money and made it harder for the company to gain a foothold. According to The Verge's article, slog was so effective in New York that Uber launched it nationwide. Every time Lyft expanded to a new city, slog was there to slow them down. Lyft claimed that Uber employees intentionally canceled over 5,000 rides. Uber called Lyft's accusation simply untrue. But one Uber employee told The Verge, What's simply untrue is that not only does Uber know about this, they're actively encouraging these actions day to day, and in doing so are flat out lying to their customers, the media, and their investors. The story went viral, and the blowback was severe. Eventually, Travis owned up to some tactics of Operation Slog. Though he continued to deny canceling rides, Travis maintained that recruiting Lyft drivers was fair game. It was good for the shared economy, and it gave drivers more opportunity to make more money. Despite the bad publicity, Uber's efforts to thwart Lyft were arguably effective. Lyft would never surpass Uber in size or scope. At the start of 2014, Uber was in 100 cities. By the end of that year, the company had expanded to over 400 worldwide. Lyft never caught up to where Uber started from. Still, the millions of dollars Travis spent battling Lyft ultimately ate into Uber's bottom line. In 2014, leaked documents showed that Uber lost $109 million in the second quarter alone, and the losses weren't constrained to just the U.S. market. As Uber expanded overseas in 2014, its international operation lost $237 million. 
Travis claimed the loss was normal for a rapidly growing company investing in more people and in more cities. Still, the massive losses troubled many investors, and other investors were worried about something else, something Travis called his perception problem. By 2014, Uber was a global phenomenon, but its CEO was a reviled figure, and many in the media were not shy about saying so. To them, Travis came across like a spoiled party boy, an entitled tech bro with too much power and not enough accountability. Travis felt he was being unfairly targeted by the media. He liked to have fun, sure, and he wasn't above the occasional dirty trick, but in Travis's mind, that was the Silicon Valley way. His peers, men like Sean Parker, had made it big and partied hard, and no one succeeded in the tech world without getting their hands dirty. But Travis's subsequent words and actions didn't help his perception problem. In a GQ profile in 2014 titled Uber Cab Confessions, Travis joked about creating a service for on-demand women called Boober. Comments like that gave credence to the idea that Travis was a misogynist. One journalist in particular went after Travis, technology reporter Sarah Lacey. Since she started her tech website Pando Daily in 2012, Sarah had followed Uber closely. She and her staff constantly debated the question, how morally bankrupt is Uber? Back in 2012, one of Sarah's colleagues wrote a damning piece arguing that in Uber's business model, drivers and riders were disposable cogs used to maximize Travis's profits. Two years later, in January 2014, another of Sarah's colleagues revealed that an Uber driver accused of assault had a criminal record that should have been detected by the background checks Uber claimed they were doing. That story also claimed that Uber's attitude towards rider complaints was to blame the passenger. But in October of 2014, Sarah launched her most scathing attack yet with an article she wrote titled, The Horrific Trickle-Down of Asshole Culture, why I've just deleted Uber from my phone. In the article, Sarah referenced a recent Uber scandal that came out of France, where a local Uber office ran a promotion to pair Uber riders with attractive female drivers. As Sarah wrote, I still can't believe that Uber, a company held up as a bastion of modern entrepreneurship, posted an ad that encouraged, played on, and celebrated treating women like hookers. Sarah took direct aim at Travis, calling him a sexist. Sarah also attacked Uber's investors for defending Travis, writing that she was disappointed with Uber investors who have young daughters. They should care. They should be horrified. Bill Gurley, the lanky Texan who had invested $11 million in Uber's Series A round, was deeply concerned. The Sarah Lacey article only fueled Bill's growing suspicion that Travis was becoming a liability. Bill had long been concerned with Travis's conduct as CEO. Travis fixated on breaking into China, an expensive billion-dollar proposition that Bill thought was a lost cause. Additionally, Travis had fired Uber's chief financial officer, leaving Bill to wonder if Travis was trying to hide Uber's numbers or possibly manipulate them. So Bill reached out to Travis's deputy, Emil Michael, to encourage Emil to set Travis straight. But Emil was not a friendly ear. Emil, like Travis, thought Bill, a man they called Chicken Little, was a naysayer always standing in the way of progress. As Uber grew, so too did Travis's so-called perception problem. Viral growth had catapulted Uber to the top. But now, a viral campaign against Travis, fueled by the media, threatened Uber's dominance. So Travis fought back. He launched a PR campaign designed to rehabilitate his image and reframe the conversation. But in the end, the charm offensive would backfire, and it would once again thrust Uber into the media's crosshairs. It's Saturday, November 15th, 2014, in a private dining room at the back of the Waverly Inn in Greenwich Village in Manhattan. Travis Kalanick sits at the head of a table filled with a couple dozen journalists, celebrities, and Uberettos. The dinner is officially off the record, so the drinks are flowing, and so is the conversation. Travis is hoping to make a good impression tonight and charm his list of VIP guests. He's flanked by his friend, author, pundit, and businesswoman Ariana Huffington, who chats it up with Uber investor Edward Norton. 
at the opposite end of the table, Travis's deputy Emil Michael is holding court with a handful of reporters. Emil is also supposed to be laying on the charm, but so far he's doing a terrible job. Ah, people are coming after us because we're crushing the competition. We're the real victims here. I'm sorry, Mr. Michael, I'm confused. If Uber is the victim, who's the assailant? The media. <laughs> well, uh, as a member of the media, I, I, I gotta tell you that seems like a stretch. I think you've earned some of the knocks you've taken. Oh, come on, what have we earned? We're providing a public service for the public good. What do you have to say to the women who don't feel safe in your Uber cars? Ask a hundred women whether they'd feel safer in an Uber or in a taxi. If any woman decided to delete the Uber app like Sarah Lacey did, and then go on to take a taxi ride and God forbid are assaulted, that woman should be held personally responsible for that. Well, she's not the only member of the press who feels that way. What if we gave the media a taste of their own medicine, huh? What if we spent, I don't know, a million dollars hiring a few journalists and top oppo people? Then they could look into your personal lives, your families, help us actually fight back. I bet if we looked into Sarah Lacey's personal life, we'd find all sorts of things. The reporter is stunned. If you were to do what you just suggested, the story wouldn't be about Sarah Lacey. It would be about Uber. Just think of the backlash. Oh, that wouldn't be a problem. And why is that? Because nobody would know it was us. Emil had no idea that the reporter he was talking to, the editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed News, had not been told the dinner was off the record, and he was planning to publish Emil's comments. The BuzzFeed story was quickly picked up by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and a slew of other publications and news outlets. Emil Michael, Uber's senior vice president of business, in a conversation he thought was off the record, floated the idea of hiring a team of researchers that would smear members of the press who attacked the ride-sharing company. Uber immediately went into damage control mode. Emil released an apology. Travis took to social media, tweeting, Emil's comments at a recent dinner party were terrible and do not represent the company. But right after the Emil Michael story, BuzzFeed dropped another bombshell. Well, it may have a sky-high valuation, but Uber still under fire after an executive suggested digging up dirt on journalists who are critical of the company. Uber CEO now trying to make things right. Jolene Kent with the details there. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. This is a really incredible story that just keeps on developing. Just one day after Uber told Fox Business it has not and will not investigate journalists, multiple reports have come out that the car service app has, in fact, accessed private travel data of several journalists without their permission. BuzzFeed reports that Josh Moore, the New York general manager of Uber, monitored their reporters' movement in what is called God Mode. God Mode, or God View as it was also called, was an internal company tool that allowed Uber employees to track users without their permission. People were outraged. It wasn't just that Uber had the ability to track its customers. Most people understood that that was inherent to the technology. It was how loose the internal restrictions were. Too many people had access to Godview, and there was too little oversight. Uber tried to manage the fallout. They claimed that Godview was prohibited except for legitimate business purposes like helping customers, monitoring fraud, or assisting drivers. But the damage was done. And still, the bad headlines wouldn't stop. In December of 2014, Uber faced another scandal when a driver in New Delhi, India, raped a passenger and threatened to kill her if she went to the police. But the victim did report the driver, and he was promptly arrested. The government shut down Uber in New Delhi. Protests broke out in the streets, and violence erupted between Uber drivers and local taxi officials who were already furious with Uber. The news of the rape went viral, adding to the public message that Uber didn't care about women. The same tensions between Uber and taxi drivers that sparked violence in India had raged in New York City since Uber launched there in May of 2011. Travis likened the conflict to a political campaign. Uber was the people's candidate. Their opponent was, in Travis's words, an asshole named Taxi. Nobody likes him. He's not a nice character. But he's so woven into the political machinery and fabric that a lot of people owe him favors. One of those people was New York Mayor Bill de Blasio, a staunch supporter of the New York taxi industry. As taxi operators began to lose control of the New York market, many turned to de Blasio and their local city council for help. 
In 2015, Mayor de Blasio pushed for legislation meant to capsize Uber by limiting the number of vehicles Uber could put on the road. Travis's team on the ground in New York spent millions on a political smear campaign against de Blasio and his allies. They created a new app feature called de Blasio View that showed New York riders the long wait times they could expect if de Blasio succeeded. Uber staged protests and sent out email blasts encouraging their users to tell their local representatives to leave Uber alone. Ultimately, the public outcry was so severe that de Blasio backed off. It was a watershed moment for Travis. By besting de Blasio in the city council, Travis had beaten the most powerful taxi industry in the world, at least for the moment. Still, the victory in New York gave Travis a win he desperately needed. And for Travis, it was a cause for celebration. In the fall of 2015, Travis threw a week-long bash in Las Vegas. The party was called X to the X, meaning 10 to the power of 10, celebrating the $10 billion in total gross ride bookings Uber had just surpassed. Uber rented hundreds of rooms all along the Strip for the thousands of Uber employees who were flown in from all over the world for the all-expenses-paid celebration. The highlight of the week was a private concert at the Palms Hotel, featuring special musical guest Beyonce. At the end of her performance, Travis took to the stage and screamed into the microphone that he loved everyone in the room. He boasted to the crowd that even Beyonce and her husband Jay-Z had invested in Uber. But what Travis didn't tell his employees from the stage is that he had paid Beyonce millions in future Uber stock to get her to perform. The X to the X party was expensive, costing Uber $25 million, over twice what Bill Gurley had invested back in 2011. In spite of the pushback from the media and online, in Las Vegas, standing next to Beyonce in front of a massive crowd of Uberettos, Travis again felt invincible. But the moment would be fleeting. Not long after the X to the X bash, Uber hired a young software engineer who would forever change the trajectory of Uber and of Travis's journey. Soon after taking the job, the engineer would learn that the stories in the press about Uber's toxic culture were more than just stories. When confronted with what Sarah Lacey called Uber's asshole culture, this engineer would not keep her head down. She would speak up for herself, stand up for women's rights in the workplace, and turn Travis's world upside down. On the next episode of Business Movers, software engineer Susan Fowler's Uber story reveals a systemic problem at the company. It's the first of a series of scandals that further sullies Uber's reputation and puts CEO Travis Kalanick's personal conduct under the microscope. From Wondery, this is episode one of the rise and fall of Uber for Business Movers. A quick note about our dramatizations. In most cases, we can't know everything that happened but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to learn more about Uber, we recommend Super Pumped, The Battle for Uber by Mike Isaac, Wild Ride, Inside Uber's Quest for World Domination by Adam Lashinsky, and Whistleblower, My Unlikely Journey to Silicon Valley, Speaking Out Against Injustice by Susan Fowler. Business Movers is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Barons. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written and researched by Stephen Walters, edited by Leah Waters. Executive producers are Stephen Walters for Ritual Productions and Jenny Lara Beckman and Marshall Louie for Wondering.